Today I'm going to be answering a question that absolutely nobody at any point in time wanted to know the answer to. Oh dear. So, I think it's fair to say that you guys had quite a few objections to the rules I made in the last video. That was something I expected. What I didn't expect was for the video to become one of the most successful videos on my channel. So inevitably, I pretty much have no choice but to do this challenge again. So without further ado, let's answer the following question. Can you beat Fallout New Vegas without breaking the Ten Commandments? Now despite a small minority of you feeling that I didn't need to say this, I need to once again make clear that this video is not a mockery of Christianity or any other religions. I myself am a Christian, but regardless of whether you are religious or completely despise the idea of God, I want to unite us all on what is the objectively correct belief, and that is that video games are freaking awesome. So let's go over the Ten Commandments again, and then later see what rules are relevant for this game. Here are the commandments in order. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. I got the Sabbath day completely wrong last time, so don't worry, I'm gonna learn from that mistake in this video. Honour your father and mother. Thou shalt not murder. Yes, don't worry, I'm going to be using this translation this time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And you shall not covet. Now, let's go over the rules to create as a result of this, and see what we can change from the last video. I had some people in the last video saying that I was too relaxed with the rules in certain places, and some people say that I was actually too strict with the rules in certain places. I decided that in order to get the best of both worlds, I would first create a set of hard rules, which are basically rules that I have to follow in order to meet the bare minimum requirements needed to have this challenge successfully beaten. I would then create some bonus rules, which are there to add that extra challenge in order to make this a little bit more fun. So let's go over the hard rules first. Rule number one is to not be positively affected by anything linked to a false god. We should have much less trouble with this than we did in Skyrim, because some semblance of Christianity does actually exist in Fallout New Vegas. Rule number two is don't say the Lord's name in vain. As a result of Christianity existing in this, it is very possible that our character will have dialogue options that say the Lord's name in vain. It should be simple to avoid this, but I'm going to include this rule because it's still very possible to break this. The next rule is sleep for 24 hours in a bed when it's Saturday. In the previous video, I did this on Sunday, as I forgot the seventh day of the week was a Saturday, and that Sunday was actually the first day of the week. Rule number four is don't say anything that dishonors your father or mother. People pointed out that in Skyrim, there was a specific instance where you could mention your parents. So it's very possible that there'll be instances like that in this game as well. So I'm just going to add this rule just in case. Rule number five, don't murder. That's right. For the hard rules, we're only limiting ourselves to murder. Many of you were not happy that I chose to take killing at face value. And not only that, but were also not happy that I did not make exceptions for things like animals and other creatures. So, as a bare minimum, we're only going to restrict ourselves to not committing murder. Rule number six is don't sleep with a married person. We ourselves cannot get married in this game, so the only instance where it's possible to commit adultery is by sleeping with a married person. To make this easy, we're just going to avoid following any kind of romantic options in this game whatsoever. Rule number seven is don't take anything that would be considered stealing in real life. We will analyze this on a case-by-case -case basis. For the majority of this video, I'm going to be erring on the side of caution, and if there is a scenario where this might come into question, I'm going to try and avoid the scenario completely, just to play it safe. And the final rule is don't lie. This means that we shouldn't say a statement that is false, and we should not make a promise and not follow through on it. This means that if we pick a dialogue option where we say we will do something, we actually have to go and do it. Now let's get into the bonus rules. The first one is don't kill. 
This is where we'll follow the same restriction that we did in the last video, where I'm not allowed to kill anything at all, not animals, creatures, nothing, under any circumstances. The next part of the bonus challenge is to complete the game on hardcore mode. This means the game will just be a bit more difficult, and this means that we'll constantly have to give our character food and water in order to survive. And the last bonus rule is to get the most moral ending. After looking into what people have said, the majority of people have said that the most moral ending is the NCR one. I've also chosen to completely rule out the independent ending, which is a shame as it would be by far the easiest, but the ending for that one literally has no gods included in the name. So essentially, rule number three means we have to achieve the ending where we complete the game while siding with the NCR. Now that we've got all that out of the way, let's start our adventure. Our character Christian returns, and in terms of appearance, he's currently going through his Hulk Hogan phase. When picking my specials, I decided to get rid of all the strength and perception, and max out our charisma and intelligence, and also have a decent amount of agility. During the quiz, we already have a parent brought up. In this case, about our mother. There are answers here that definitely dishonor her, which would break the commandment for sure. So we pick the ones that seems the most honorable, which is regret. We are then told certain statements and are asked to answer them on the scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree. The only statements that are actually important are the first two. The first statement is conflict just ain't in my nature. For this, we obviously strongly agree. The second statement is I ain't given to relying on others for support. We pick strongly disagree for this one, since any religion would want you to rely on the god of that religion, as well as people who follow that same religion. We pick speech, survival, and medicine as our skills. For our traits, we pick good natured, and then wild wasteland just for fun. We also turn on hardcore mode so that we can do the bonus challenge. Some of what I do in this game is inspired by a YouTuber called Nurbit, who attempted to beat this game without killing. So go check out his video if you're interested. We go to see Sunny Smiles and do the tutorial. I did say in the rule we would not kill under any circumstances, but fear not, bottles do not count. I go and see Trudy in the saloon and start the Ghost Town gunfight quest. I then speak to Ringo. I then tell Ringo what's going on. I am then tasked to get a few people to help with the quest. I get Sunny Smiles to agree to help, and then use my speech skill to persuade Trudy to help us. We also persuade Chet to open his supplies to people, and one particularly useful thing we get as a result is some leather armor. We use our speech to get extra supplies from Doc as well. We don't get dynamite from Easy Pete, since we don't want to do any killing ourselves. We then tell Ringo the good news. I then hide while everyone shoots the powder gangers, and we end up managing to beat the mission without any of the good guys dying. I level up my speech skill, and we acquire the swift learner perk to get experience more easily. We then make our way to Prim, but get chased by some geckos. Getting away was really difficult, and I only escaped with my life by using the complex tactic of pressing forward on the analog stick. We get warned by an NCR trooper that the place is off limits. I actually choose to listen to him, since I can just head straight to Novak anyway. On the way to Novak, we find a powder gang camp that we can use as a fast travel location. The powder gangers thankfully don't attack us and just leave us alone, although I inadvertently run past creatures that definitely won't leave us alone. I walk through Prim Pass and get destroyed by a Deathclaw. I try to sneak through a second time round, but this time it thankfully didn't spawn or at least wasn't anywhere nearby. We enter Novak and enter Manny Vargas's room. We then look at his terminal to trigger the next point of the quest. On the way to Boulder City, we get shot by a few enemies, although I was too busy running for my life to see who. We then get attacked by... butterflies? Then some scorpions come after me, and it's really not my day today. We do eventually manage to make it to Boulder City in one piece. A man named Monroe tells me about the situation with the Great Khans. I tell him I can negotiate with them, and he lets me go through. I speak to a man named Jessup, and I use my speech skills to persuade him to free the hostages. We then level up twice and pick up the educated perk. Since we don't want to lie, and we promised the Great Khans that we would let them go in exchange for freeing the hostages, I insist to Monroe to hold up our end of the deal. I then level up again, and I am able to maximize my speech craft. I decide to start investing in my sneak skill too, so I can sneak past enemies. We make it to the Freeside East Gate, and then manage to run towards Freeside and enter without getting killed. We now need to try and enter the Strip. 
two of the ways in which we enter would probably breach one of the commandments. Having enough science would mean we'd have to lie to the security robots, and the other would require us to take an NCR uniform that isn't ours, which would be a form of stealing. It's not possible for us to legitimately join the NCR until we leave the Lucky 38, which requires us to get into the strip in the first place. So doing this the honest way isn't possible. If we have over 2,000 caps, we can enter the strip by passing the credit check and we actually don't lose the caps. But unfortunately, we don't have enough. We could also pay 500 caps to get a passport, but we should probably save those caps for important supplies when things get more difficult later. I decide to do the King's quest line, which will allow me to get a passport as a favor at the end of it. We ask the King for some work, and he asks us to investigate Oris the bodyguard. We pay 200 caps for Oris's service. I end up not having enough barter to get my money back from him. If he died indirectly somehow, we'd have permission to loot our caps back from him, since he was running a scam. We aren't able to kill him ourselves, however, so we end up trying to provoke him to attack us by punching one of the bodies pretending to be dead. That did not go well. I later discovered that if you do provoke him, the people nearby don't help attack him. So unfortunately, there's no way to have him indirectly killed. So those caps are lost. That said, we got given that amount of caps by the king. So we actually didn't lose anything overall from this quest. We then get given the second task to investigate some attacks on freeside locals by the NCR. We ask some of the victims questions and report our findings to the king. In order to get the information we need, we can't speak to the NCR missionary since there's no way to get info off of him without doing a quiz, but doing that quiz involves us lying about being an NCR citizen. I could bribe Rockface to give me that info instead, but that would be expensive even if we had high enough barter skills. In the end, if I speak to Julie, then head to the location of where the NCR are. Speaking to the left trooper will allow me to perform a speech check that doesn't resort to lying, and it will allow me to speak to the major. It took me a while to realise this because the Fallout wiki was not being helpful, and I had to do a lot of wandering around before realising this was an option. She states that she sent troops to negotiate with the king, but they were attacked as a result. I inform the king of this. Before I can though, Pesa threatens us not to tell him anything. I want to create peace with the NCR and the king, so I intend to tell him about it. So I don't lie to Pesa here and tell him that the king has a right to know. News then comes about Pesa attacking the NCR, so I get ordered to check it out. I make my way to the Major and tell her that the King had no idea an envoy was sent. She stands down and I report back to the King. Reporting back to him means that we've managed to create a truce between the NCR and the Kings. Finally, he tells us we can ask of him one favour. I forgot that one of the options was to ask for caps, and since a passport costs 500 caps, and he rewards us with 1000, I decided I might as well ask for the caps and just buy the passport. I'm also able to level up again. I then use my speech skill to persuade Ralph to sell me a passport so that I have 500 caps left over. I then realise something. The passport I receive is referred to as a counterfeit passport. For some reason, I thought the passport would be genuine, and I never really thought about this properly. But since this isn't a genuine passport, and I'm using this, I consider this a form of lying because I have to tell the robot that I have a passport. At the very least, if I load an older save, I am 1000 caps closer to the 2000 caps requirement to enter, which means doing the King's Quest was not a complete waste of time. I have 1200 caps overall, so I need to make 800 more to meet the caps requirement. I didn't want to resort to gambling since it is a bit of a grey area. You could also argue it's a form of coveting and breaks that commandment. I decided to speak to Gloria Van Graff in the Silver Rush building and ask for work, as this will lead to not only getting more than a thousand gold, but also getting me some decent armor. It is not until later that I realize that completing this quest line requires us to do an action that's completely immoral. I get put on bodyguard duty, and out of all the people that try to get through, only one attacks us no matter what. And thankfully, the other bodyguard killed him in one shot, so I didn't need to kill him myself. We get 300 caps after returning to Gloria, and get given another job to deliver a package. We meet the guy and deliver the package. I report back and get told to tie up a loose end with Sharon Cassidy. As stated before, I didn't realise what I'd have to do here, and I actually glossed over the wiki guide of this quest, and didn't realise that fully completing this questline would require me to approve of a straight up murder. So I decide to stop at this point with only 300 caps left to go. I am disappointed that I wasn't able to get that armour, but it's a sacrifice 
sacrifice I had to make in order to fulfill the will of God. I sell some of the stuff I have to just barely cross the 2000 caps threshold. I then speak to the robot and pass the credit check, and with that, I finally manage to enter the strip. Man, that was a lot of back and forth. This section took me quite a while to get through. I didn't think it would take me this long, and granted that was partly just due to me making decisions that would get me stuck, but it seems like avoiding telling lies is actually going to become one of the hardest parts of this challenge. Now we need to confront Benny at the Tops Casino. Once I enter, I go straight to Benny himself and confront him directly. When he suggests we go to his suite for a chat, I use my speech skills to allow him to lose the bodyguards. After chatting to Benny for a bit, he offers us a job, and we do the most Christian thing we can possibly do by saying, forget it, I forgive you. This spirit of forgiveness you're showing me, it's enough to make a player rethink what it means to win your 18 carat baby all the way. Unfortunately, we are reminded of the sinful nature of man, as Benny sends his bodyguards to kill me. Thankfully, God created humans to have their own unique qualities, and in the case of these men, he did not give them the qualities of good bodyguards, since they couldn't figure out how to chase me when there was an unlocked door standing between us. We then get an invitation to see Kaiser from the Legion, as well as Ambassador Crocker from the NCR. You know what I'm thinking now? Yeah, I got a pretty good idea. Seriously? I then go to see Mr. House at the Lucky 38. Mr. House ridicules me on my foolishness to confront Benny. I say that I was ambushed, since I was completely flabbergasted that he didn't accept my forgiveness of him, and also didn't change his sinful ways. Really? What did you expect? By the end of my conversation with Mr. House, it is here that I have to make a hard choice. I have to explicitly agree to do what he asks, or tell him no thanks. Since I can't lie, this means that whatever I say to him is what I have to carry out. As stated before, the NCR seems like the most moral choice to make at the end of the game, so I am gonna try and push for that ending. So I tell Mr. House, no thanks. He tells me he'll give me time to think over the consequences of what I've said, and I leave. I could have avoided having to make this choice if I just went straight to the Legion, but I know that I won't pick the Mr. House option anyway, and I wanted to have the retrieval of the Platinum Chip to appear on my map. So this choice by itself will cause no inconvenience to us, but it does highlight a concern down the line. For example, if I have no choice but to explicitly agree to do what the Legion tells me to do, I will have no choice but to side with them. And let's just say, when it comes to morals, they are the last choice I want to pick. I fast travel to the closest place to my destination, then make my way to Cottonwood Cove so that I can get to the Legion Fort. I have the occasional enemies chasing me, but apart from that, I get to Cottonwood Cove without issues. I then travel straight to the fort, we get the platinum chip from Kaiser, and I don't end up having to agree to do anything, so there's no risk of lying yet. I end up going to Mr. House's bunker under the weather station. I enter the bunker, and Mr. House says he wants me to upgrade the Securitrons instead of destroying the bunker. I tell him we'll see what happens, since I don't want to explicitly side with him. However, I do want to upgrade the Securitrons, since otherwise the other option is to destroy them. You could make an argument that the Securitrons aren't living creatures. However, there are interactions with robots in the game that indicate that they may have some sort of sentiency, and therefore I consider their lives to have value, and destroying the bunker to be a form of killing. When Nurbit had to go through this section, he stated that he had to use all 30 of his stim packs to avoid dying. I forgot to stack up on stim packs, and had to go through this section with two stim packs, a purified water, and an iguana on a stick, instead of backtracking. With a mix of having the Lord on my side, as well as just pure stubbornness, I managed to get through it in what was probably about 10 attempts. When I returned to Kaiser, I thought I'd run into a problem where I wouldn't be able to complete the quest unless I lie and say that I destroy the bunker. But when I go to him, he just says he heard the ground shake, and assumes that means I did my job. I get asked to pick Benny's fate, and the most moral option is for me to set him free. Unfortunately, since I don't have a stealth boy or lockpick, I can't let him get away sneakily. And even if I did, I would lose my reputation with the Legion anyway, which I want to keep as this will be useful in a bit. I end up not talking to Benny, since the only way I can not kill him directly is by resorting to crucifixion. And by speaking to him, I have to say that he'll be crucified for my amusement, which I don't think is a morally good thing to say. Instead, I choose to walk away from the situation entirely which Kaiser warned me would lead to him being crucified anyway, but at least I'm not making a conscious decision for that to happen to him. I make my way back
back to Cottonwood Cove, and it's here that I decide as a bonus to do something heavily inspired by Exodus, and I attempt to free the slaves that are trapped there. If I manage to unlock the cage and remove their collars, they would end up getting killed by the Legion members there, and I'd be useless to help since I can't kill them, which is exactly why I kept my reputation with the Legion since I can go straight to the Canyon Runner and purchase the slaves. I wasn't able to talk to him until now since he would just repeatedly tell me to see Kaiser until I did my quest for him. I don't use my speech to get them cheaper since that would require lying, so I pay the full 300 caps. I then tell the slaves the good news and that they're all free to go and they get away without any of the Legion members trying to kill them. I then notice that despite the fact that I left the fort and what Kaiser said, the quest log to decide Benny's fate is still there. Since my reputation with the Legion no longer matters, as another bonus, I want to see if I can save Benny. Although he has done horrible things, I think leaving him to be crucified is not something I should allow. After all, Jesus died precisely so that no one would have to suffer the same punishment as him. And isn't the whole point of forgiveness that we give second chances to people that don't deserve it? I decide to err on the side of caution and try to obtain my stealth boy and bobby pin by having it given to me consensually by someone instead of looting it in the world, where it might have been someone's property at some point. According to the wiki, someone named Lily gives us a stealth boy when she becomes a temporary companion as part of a quest. Well, turns out the Fallout New Vegas wiki lied, as when I did this, she did no such thing. The only other ways of getting a stealth boy without looting it is by either doing a test that requires me to buy an add-on or gain higher Legion reputation. I end up deciding to come back to this later and just move on to the main quest for now. I end up talking to Ambassador Dennis Crocker so that I can start the NCR questline. I agree to do the quest he has for me, which is to get this group of people called the Boomers to agree to help. I manage to just about dodge the explosions and speak to an old lady named Pearl and have to assist with people in the area in order to get her to agree to help the NCR. In order to increase my reputation enough with them without having to kill anyone, I need to speak to Pete and exhaust all dialogue options with him, as well as listening to his story about the boomers. This manages to get me to the accepted stage of reputation. I then speak to someone called Jack and agree to help him find his love interest. On the way, I decide to pay to use the water pump that the King's member guard as well as 12 purified water. Since up until this point, there were multiple times where my character just died from dehydration on many different occasions. I then go to the Crimson Caravan Company. On the way there, we see Ringo and he gives us some caps as a reward for helping him at the beginning of the game. I speak to the woman of interest called Janet and after she tells us she feels the same about Jack, I use my speech skill to persuade Pearl to let her enter. I tell both of them the good news and I also manage to persuade her boss Alice to let her leave with the wages she is owed. Both Jack and Janet meet, and I finish the quest. Next, I agree to repair the broken solar panels for a man named Loyal. I travel to Helios 1 to grab the spare parts. Since I am now helping the NCR, I have the option to say that I am with them to get access. I do not consider anything I salvage here to be stealing from the NCR, since the quest I am doing for the Boomers is for the purpose of getting them to assist the NCR, and it's also a quest that I am directly tasked by the NCR, so I would therefore have permission from them to do this. I managed to salvage 5 array parts, since they only required 20 repair skill. I then return and manage to repair all the solar arrays I'm tasked to do. After returning to Loyal, I get enough reputation to be considered liked, and I am able to return to Pearl to do the next part of the quest. I then I then go back to Loyal, and I'm tasked with raising a bomber from out of the water. I don't bother trying to gather the parts needed to have a rebreather to breathe underwater, and I manage to attach the ballast to the plane with minimal issues. I then trigger the detonator, and the plane successfully resurfaces. I tell Loyal the good news, and return to Pearl. We reach idolized status with the boomers, and I can level up. It is by this point that Saturday almost comes for the first time. Up until this point, I leveled up my explosive skill until now, where it finally reached 50. Now that I'm at this point, my plan to save Benny comes back into play. I head to Cottonwood Cove and speak to Decanus Severus. I tell him that I can show him how to disarm the NCR's mines, and use my new explosive skills to successfully explain it. I then do the exact same thing over and over again. This is almost definitely some kind of exploit. If not with the game, then at the very least this man's awful ability to remember things. But I don't consider it a breach of the commandments, since after all, there is no commandment saying, thou shalt 
about not exploit the short-term memory loss of a sexist slave owner in football gear. I don't exploit this any more than I need to, and get myself to a reputation of being liked by the Legion. I then speak to a man named Lucius, and because of my good reputation, I unlock the Legion safe house. By this point, our first Saturday comes around, and I manage to find a bedroll that I can sleep in without it having a red colour indicating it's a crime, and sleep for 24 hours. I arrive at the safe house. Atticus is there when I arrive, and I take two stealth boys from him. This means that I obtained a stealth boy that was given consensually by someone else, instead of picking it up off the ground. You'd probably be right if you argued that I was being way too strict when it comes to what is classified as stealing, and if it ever comes down to it, I won't consider all forms of looting stuff in the world to be a breach of the rule. I just wanted to avoid it if it was possible for me to do so, and in this case, it just about was. Now all that's left to do is to obtain a bobby pin. Thankfully, I'm able to just buy them outright by going to Miguel's pawn shop in Westside. Finally, I travel back to the fort and give Benny the stealth boy and bobby pin. Baby, your generosity and spirit of forgiveness? Off the charts. And I use the stealth boy on myself so I don't get attacked. Yeah, that doesn't work. So I put on the stealth boy first, then free Benny. That doesn't work either. No matter what I did, or when I did it, the stealth boy was utterly useless. So the only chance I have is to run for my life. After multiple attempts, I manage to reach the gate to leave the fort just before I die, and I arrive at Cottonwood Cove, and manage to swim away, and manage to swim away, and I manage to swim away by going underwater, occasionally getting some air, and sneaking away by hugging one of the hills. Now from what I could tell, when Benny used the stealth boy, none of the guards attacked him, and it seems like they couldn't see him. So in my head, I believe Benny's escape was successful, and I like to think he was truly humbled by us showing him the forgiveness that God would want us to. And I reckon he will one day realise the errors of his ways, and become a Christian like us. Did I waste a lot of unnecessary time doing something that wasn't at all required to beat this challenge? Yes. <laughs> Was it worth it? Totally. After this, the first thing I do is buy tons of food from Gennaro at Freeside, since at this point, we are literally about to die from starvation. I then go to Julie Farkas to get rid of all my injuries, and also buy some stim packs from her. Lastly, I drink some more water from the fountain, and now my character has been nursed to full condition. I then tell Ambassador Crocker about the boomers being willing to help us, and I can move on to the next part of the questline. For this part, I need to either kill Pacer, or talk to the king and ask Pacer to stop attacking the NCR. Unfortunately, since I already asked a favour from him, he refuses to stop the attacks on the NCR just from us asking him to. Thankfully, if we're told this, the game allows us to report straight back to Ambassador Crocker, and he tells us to report to Colonel Moore. Going to Colonel Moore will fail the quest for us, but still allow us to progress without killing if we just let the NCR kill the king. Instead of doing this, however, I respond to Ambassador Crocker by saying that sending NCR soldiers into Freeside would be a bad idea. He then suggests that I instead speak to Colonel... Hasu? We then go to Camp McCarran to speak to him. He then says he is willing to provide food, water, and other support to Freeside if the King promises for the violence to stop. I tell the King what's happening, and he says that the offer sounds reasonable, but Pacer decides to start shooting. He and many other King's members die, but the King survives. I tell Ambassador Crocker that the King has agreed to the peace, and we're told to report to Cologne or Moore for more assignments. <laughs> I am ordered by Colonel Moore to deal with the Great Khans, and thankfully, the game gives me the option to deal with them diplomatically. I fast travel to the closest place to my destination, and make my way to Red Rock Canyon. Once I arrive there, I speak to the Papa Khan, and I attempt to convince him to break his allegiance with Kaiser. This doesn't go well, but when I leave the building, a man named Regis tells me that I might be able to persuade the Papa Khan if I can convince the rest of the tribe to back me. I can obtain the trust of two tribe members called Jack and Diane if I convince just one of them, since they will both copy one another. If I speak to Diane, I'll have to find some proof that the Legion persecutes drug runners in order to persuade her. However, if I talk to Jack, I can use my speech skill to persuade him straight away, and Diane agrees as a result. On my way back, two people attempt to kill me on behalf of someone named Carl. I attempt to run away and get others to kill them, but they just stand around doing nothing. So I load an older save and fast travel straight to the Red Rock Canyon so I can enter the longhouse without getting attacked. I speak to Carl while the Papa Khan is present, and use my speech skill to get Carl to accidentally disgrace himself in front of him. 
Having Carl dead should theoretically prevent those two people from trying to kill me on his behalf going forward. In order to convince Regis to stand with me, I need to find evidence that Kaiser will annihilate the Great Khans. According to the wiki, I wouldn't need to do this if I disgraced Carl by giving the Papa Khan his journal, and apparently using my speech to disgrace him wasn't good enough to persuade Regis. Unfortunately, getting this evidence is nearly impossible since it needs to be grabbed from Kaiser's tent at the fort. Plus, I would consider it stealing since we are no longer on good terms with the Legion. Thankfully, according to the wiki, in order to persuade the Papa Khan, I only need to get the support of three of the four Great Khan members. This is also a lie. You need the support of all four of them, and I don't realise this until later. Since once I reach her after getting past a load of crabs and death claws, and persuading her to stand with me, once I travel back to the Red Rock Canyon, for some reason I'm not given the dialogue option to convince Papa Khan. We also can't use Carl's journal after he's dead, which is a shame because when we take it, it's no longer marked red, which means we would have been able to get away for it not being stealing. Whereas if we load an older save, since it's explicitly marked red, and we lose karma when taking this, I personally consider it stealing. And once again, by taking the diary from the Legion while I am vilified by them, I also consider it a form of stealing. This means that at this point, I am truly stuck and I have no other choice but to steal. Load an older save from when I was in good standing with the Legion. I load the save where we were at the point before I saved Benny. I take the slave ledger right in front of the eyes of Legion members, to which they have no objections whatsoever. I then have to free Benny all over again, barely escape with my life, do all the missions for Ambassador Crocker, get all the Great Khan members to stand with me again, and then persuade the final member Regis by giving him the Legion Slave Ledger as evidence. After all of this, I finally get the option to persuade the Papa Khan. With my speech skill, I persuade him to let the Great Khans reclaim their own glory. This means that they will peacefully leave the desert when the alternate option gets them to do a suicide mission against the Legion. I report back to Colonel Moore and simply tell her that the Khans won't be a problem anymore. I am then given the task to speak to Lisa O'Malley at the NCR Embassy so that I can investigate the Amurtas to see if their plans oppose the NCR. I go to speak to Lisa and then get tasked to speak to the receptionist in Gamora about Amurta activities. She tells me to speak to someone called Kachino. In order to get him to help us, we need to find evidence that he's done some shady stuff. It is here that in order to progress the quest, I need to do something morally questionable. The only way I can progress this quest is by stealing his journal from his room or by pickpocketing it off him directly. Now, many of you stated in my previous video that if I only borrow an item and give it back, then it's not stealing. The quest forces me to make a choice here, so I have no choice but to do this. If we take the book from his room, we will actually lose karma and the metrics will actually consider this stealing. But for some reason, if I pickpocket the book of him directly, this actually doesn't result in a karma loss. To make things even weirder, when I go and check the metrics, it still says that I haven't picked anyone's pocket, possibly because it was a quest item, so pickpocketing is definitely the better option here, since not even the game considers this stealing. I pick the option to return the journal to him for 100 caps and for him to agree to share information about the family. I then reverse pickpocket him to give him his 100 caps back. Since by taking something and returning it in return for being given money, we can't really take a moral stance and this would almost definitely be considered stealing. But by giving the caps back, we might be able to argue that we took his journal off him for the purpose of getting him to expose the criminal history of other members. And the argument of borrowing it is much more convincing. That said, I am curious to hear your thoughts on this, so please leave your thoughts in the comment section. I personally won't consider this a breach of the rule, but it really felt like we were treading on thin ice there. We're then told to speak to two different people. The first one we speak to is Troik. We ask him some questions related to a murder, and our medical skill is high enough to figure out that his story doesn't add up. I then talk to Big Sal and tell him this, and instead of using our speech skill to get him out of his contract, I pay him 300 caps. This is because the statement we say for the speech check isn't exactly truthful. It is worth noting that if we actually investigated this in alternate way, we can uncover evidence that Troik was set up. So by paying for him to get out of his contract, we're not actually helping a murder, since Troik is actually innocent. We tell Troik that Big Sal said he's free to go, so he agrees to help us in return. He tells us about some thermite that he has, which he was planning to use to destroy some guns that they stole from the NCR. If we use our speech to get him to deploy the thermite, he will get caught and then killed. So we tell him to give us the thermite so we can 
do it ourselves. We place the thermite on the weapons and hit the detonator so they all get destroyed. We tell Kachino about this, and he tells us it's now time to take out the two big bosses. This was surprising, because according to the wiki, I actually had to do the other part of the quest, which is where we talk to someone called Clandon. But it turns out we managed to trigger the next section and completely skip that part. This is good, because this would have required us to do some similarly questionable stuff to what we did with Kachino earlier. We go to the big bosses, and I use my speech skill to get Big Sal to tell me his entire plan before he kills me. This is a situation where we have very limited options on what to do. In order for the quest to actually be completed, both of the bosses have to die. The quest will not complete until both of them are dead, and we obviously can't kill them. We can tell Big Sal that Nero is planning to betray him thanks to our speech skill, but this would involve lying. The door to leave is locked behind us, and although we can pickpocket the key from Big Sal so that we can leave and hope others fire at them, we actually can't return it since we don't have the ability to drop keys. So therefore, this would definitely be classified as stealing and not borrowing, since we have no way to return it. Thankfully, we do have Kachino in the room of us, and he has a gun. And although it is difficult, I am able to get him to kill them by using some stim packs to get us some health and taking the bulk of the fire from Big Sal and Nero so that they don't fire at Kachino. As a result, Kachino successfully kills them both, he thanks us for our help, and then we return to Colonel Moore to complete the quest. I am then given orders to make Mr. House no longer a threat. We use the platinum chip, so that we can make our way to the antechamber where Mr. House is located. We're able to easily run straight past the Securitrons to unlock the elevator straight to the chamber. Once we arrive, we then unseal the chamber, and then we speak to the real body of Mr. House and tell him what's going on. We then tell him we'll disable the cerebral interface, which will prevent him from doing anything, but he won't die. He then says this. No! Don't disable cerebrum! I'd rather be killed! Just kill me! Unfortunately, for his sake, one of the commandments clearly states, Thou shalt not kill. This is an unfortunately cruel fate for him, but it's the only choice we have. We leave and the Securitrons no longer try to kill us, so we're able to leave the Lucky 38 without problem. We then report back to Colonel Moore. We're told that we need to deal with the Brotherhood of Steel. In order to avoid us having to loot anything that isn't ours, we head to the 188 trading post and get Veronica, a former member of the Brotherhood of Steel, as our companion. We then travel to the Hidden Valley, and Veronica speaks into the intercom, which allows us to go through. Having Veronica with us allows us to skip the first task, and the Brotherhood of Steel questline triggers. I then tell her it's time to part ways, but let her go to the Lucky 38, so she has a nicer place to live than she currently does. We speak to Elder McNamara, and he gives us a task. The only way we can beat this section without killing anyone is by finishing the Brotherhood of Steel questline, and then getting them to agree to a truce with the NCR. Since otherwise, the only alternative is to either kill all the Brotherhood of Steel members, or blowing the entire bunker up, which again would result in us killing them. A paladin called Hardin then approaches us and asks us to help him become the Elder. If we side with him, it's impossible to have a truce with the NCR, so we shut him down right off the bat. I then go and retrieve the three holotapes. This isn't considered stealing, because we are returning these to the Elder of the Brotherhood of Steel, of which these dead bodies were formerly members of. We get the first one of these, however, our obstacle comes when we have to loot a keycard that doesn't belong to us in order to get the holotape at the Repcon headquarters. Some of you argue that it's not stealing, and most likely you're correct, but once again, I'm erring on the side of caution, and I'm avoiding looting it anyway. Plus, there's also the fact that the headquarters is actually still functioning, so it's not like we're looting it in a place where the place is completely obsolete. For that reason, I do a couple of quests so that I can level up my science to 50, since it's already at 30. I first do the quest called That Lucky Old Sun. The quest was easy enough, and I pick the option to retarget the power to the whole region so that it's shared with everyone equally. After completing that quest, I then talk to Yes Man for the first time, as I've already fulfilled the requirements to complete a few quests for him. This allows me to level up, and I get my science up to 47. Thanks to the specific choice I picked for the previous quest, I was rewarded with a big book of science which gives me a permanent boost, which is the exact amount I need to get my science skill up to 50. I travel back to the Repcon headquarters and hack into the terminal to get past the door. I'm stuck here when a robot says that there's an unauthorized facial pattern. If I use my speech skill, I can pass. 
but this will require me to line. The problem is, the second option is also a line, because in this option we say we were just leaving, which is not true because we need to go up there. So I'm literally forced to pick a lie here. Thankfully, I was able to get past this by getting the robot to follow me. Once they followed me to a certain point, they just turned around, and then when I ran past them, the dialogue didn't trigger. The robots on the next floor just tell me to vacate the premises, and it doesn't have any dialogue options. So this is perfectly fine since we don't have to lie here. I then make it straight to the third floor and successfully grab the holotape, and I quickly get out of there before anyone becomes hostile to us. The third and final holotape is thankfully super easy to acquire and doesn't require us to do anything special. I give the three holotapes to the Elder and progress to the next part of the quest. We are tasked to meet with three Brotherhood Scouts. There really isn't much to say about this part, I managed to get through this part quite quickly, since all the Scouts were fairly near to a fast travel location I unlocked. I report my findings to the Elder, and I'm then told to report to someone called Lorenzo regarding a failing air filtration system. Lorenzo tells me I need to scavenge some equipment from different vaults. I make my way to Vault 22, and we are forced to loot a keycard, but since the vault is completely abandoned and is also obsolete for the purpose it's used for, I don't consider this stealing. We then use it to unlock the cave door, and here I find that Mantis from Kung Fu Panda has had a bunch of children, and they try to kill me with their Kung Fu skills. Thankfully, we managed to get away from them. When we reach the room, we managed to find the items that we needed to scavenge from this vault. Again, I don't consider this stealing, since the vault is completely abandoned and obsolete. Once we escape the vault, we make our way to Vault 3. We need to run past some enemies in order to reach the vault. Once we enter, a fiend asks us what we're doing here. And unfortunately, it is here that we realise that our challenge with the NCR has most likely come to an end, and thus ending the bonus challenge. We can do a speech check to prevent them from being hostile, but we have to lie in order to do this. But if we tell the truth, and they attack us, or we trick them into thinking we're someone they're not by disguising ourselves, then by taking the item from them, this is definitely considered stealing. So in this section, we are literally forced to either lie or steal. There is perhaps one lifeline that just might save this for us. This lifeline requires us to visit our old friends at Red Rock Canyon. I speak to Diane and tell her that I want to make some caps. She asks me to look into their missing drug runner. Turns out he's at Cottonwood Cove. We find him easily and set him free. When we return to Diane, she offers us a reward, and I choose to be rewarded with caps. She then asks me to deliver a mildly suspicious package. I deliver the package without issue and return back to Diane. When I ask for some work, she asks us to deliver a highly suspicious package, which she admits is full of Jet and Psycho. Her explicitly saying what's in the package is very important. And who do I need to deliver this to? Someone called the Motor Runner, who is located inside Vault 3. By this point, it is almost Saturday, so I wait a bit, then sleep for 24 hours. We then enter Vault 3, and once again, the Fiend asks us what we're doing here. But this time, if we do the speech check, we are actually telling the truth. This means that the enemies stop becoming hostile without us having to disguise ourselves or perform any form of deception and they allow me to go straight to the delivery location that would have otherwise been locked. We then deliver the drugs to the motor runner, since that way we're actually fulfilling what we said we'd do in the speech check. And it turns out the part we need to take is in that very same room, and we take it in front of the motor runner, to which he has no objection, which means that I can get away with not considering this stealing. And for now, our goal to beat this challenge with the NCR remains intact. Gosh. Who knew that drug dealing was the only way we could get the most moral outcome? I then make my way to the final vault I need to scavenge for the Brotherhood of Steel. More of Mantis's clones try to kill me with their kung fu, but thankfully we manage to avoid them, as well as some rats, and grab the last item we need from a locker that's underwater. Once again, the place is abandoned and completely obsolete, so I don't consider this stealing. We manage to escape the place, give the parts to Lorenzo, report back to the Elder, and we finally manage to complete the Brotherhood of Steel questline. And my gosh, did that take forever. But we actually pulled it off. With this questline completed, we finally have the option to peacefully resolve the situation with the Brotherhood of Steel and the NCR. When I tell the Elder that the NCR want to destroy the Brotherhood, he suggests a truce and says he will offer the NCR support. We report this to Moore, and then we can finally move on to the final part of the quest to protect the President. We report to Ranger Grant, and there's an automatic time skip. We are then called to assist him with protecting the president. We can actually perform a speech check to get to the president's vertebird when it lands. 
It's not really a lie, since we do actually want to see the vertebrate. It's just that it turns out it's for the purpose of saving the president's life. When the suspicious individual plants the bomb on the vertebrate, I am able to successfully disarm it. This is actually as a result of leveling up my explosive skill to 50 in the process of trying to save Benny. I didn't realize it would actually be essential here. I then report this to Ranger Grant, and he cancels the speech. The president leaves in his vertebrate and safely flies away. We complete the quest and level up again. Here, we finally complete the For the Republic Part 2 questline and cross the point of no return. We have now successfully committed ourselves to fight for the NCR at the Battle of Hoover Dam, and we are also able to level up again. We are now in the end game, and let's hope it doesn't have the same tragic end as the previous run did. For the Battle of Hoover Dam, I'm able to easily run into the proceeding rooms because the Legion are busy trying to kill NCR soldiers. I get to Power Plant 1, then make my way upstairs and get to the elevator so that I can enter the Hoover Dam Visitor Center. I then go outside. After a few attempts, I manage to get to the Hoover Dam checkpoint by just running past enemies. We then speak to the commander who offers us his support, and in order to have the minimum amount of casualties, I tell the NCR that I can handle this myself. This is a bold statement to make because we have no stim packs and barely any health left. However, when crossing the rest of the dam, I found that when you save and then reload that save, there seems to be a small grace period where the enemies either do no damage or only a small amount at best. This isn't always the case, and sometimes I would load saves where I'd instantly die, but the majority of the time, this would work to our advantage. Exploiting this was the only way I managed to get across the dam and enter the Legate's camp with no stimpaks and barely any health left. I get through the final stretch doing the exact same thing, and I kid you not, I make it to Legate Lenius with one health bar remaining. It is here that my 100 speech skills plays its final and crucial part. This speech skill is the only way I can avoid killing him. So it's important that none of these speech skills are a form of lying. Otherwise, this whole run is over, and the bonus challenge will fail here. The first speech check is not a lie. With all the people we have assisting us on top of the NCR, this battle is probably in our favor, even if I myself can't do anything about it. The next speech check is also not a lie, since it is just a factual statement. The next check is just a question, so again, not a lie. The next one is also not a lie, since it is only half a statement that doesn't conclude with a point. The next speech check is the first one that requires 100 speech skill. We first say quite a vague statement. It is not clear what it means yet, so for now it isn't a lie on its own. Every speech check from here on out also requires 100 speech skill. The penultimate speech check talks about how the NCR's weakness is its sheer size, and that weakness will be too much for the Legion, since it'll take their entire army to hold the West. This is an honest and believable statement, as it's stating something that is very much plausible, and is therefore making this check, and the previous one, not a lie. The last check, which is the one last check we need in order to finish this run, <sighs> merely concludes the point made in the previous check, once again stating a very plausible event, which means it is also not a lie. I tell the Legate there is victory and wisdom, and then perform one last optional speech check where we say he will see war differently to how he currently does. He doesn't seem to take this to heart, but nonetheless, he flees. I thought after this point, the Legion would stop attacking me, but I actually still got attacked. Nonetheless, I am able to use the same save trick that I used before to trigger the final part of the game. We pick some inconsequential dialogue options and trigger the ending cutscene. And with that, our challenge to beat Fallout New Vegas without breaking the Ten Commandments is a mission success. Probably. Going over the rules I made for myself, I'd say that I have a pretty strong case to say that I followed both the hard rules and the bonus rules successfully. This was actually really unexpected, since I did not think it would be possible to beat any game without breaking the Ten Commandments, let alone a game like Fallout New Vegas. But it turns out it is possible. The only instances where it actually became questionable as to whether or not what we did was stealing is when we had to investigate the Immerters, because we had to take an item and give it back. 
and the other cases was where we had to loot some items in the world by doing the NCR missions. It is worth noting that if we just followed the hard rules, we'd be able to completely skip both of these things since we could just do the Yes Man questline, and doing these quests are not necessary to complete that questline. I also want to thank you so much for the support I received in the last video. All jokes aside, I actually cannot believe a lot of people enjoyed the video that much. And I really do hope that this video also lives up to your expectations. If you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and click that notification bell. On a side note, I also try and make some animations for my YouTube channel, and I'm working on one at the moment. There's some animations that you can find that already exist on my channel. I have a Patreon where you have the option to support me while I do this. So if you do want to support me, feel free to do so, but doing so is completely optional. Simply supporting me by watching my videos is already more than I can ask of you. One last thing, as of the time this video has been uploaded, it has been 10 years since I started making videos on this channel. And even though my upload schedule was one of the most inconsistent schedules of all time, I never gave up on this channel. This channel has been one of the best parts of my life, and has honestly played a big part in helping me get through some of the worst parts of my life. I apologise for getting so sentimental there, but this is just such an important occasion for me, and I couldn't end this video without highlighting this special occasion. With all that said, thank you guys so much for watching this video, and peace out.